And so today we're going to be talking about implementing micro credentials as a system of support and evaluation of district goals. And we could talk about research, we could talk about policy. There was just the policy conversation in DC that's going on between yesterday and today. And I'm happy to have all of those conversations, but I wanted to really um, just like kind of like drive down a bit more on what I was going to talk to you all about so we have more specific questions that we can work with and also wanted to share a lot of case studies that we're looking at because I get the privilege of being able to see um, a very wide range of work happening all across the nation and really exciting across um, in other like countries as well who are interested in micro credentials. So again my name is Odelia Young, uh, Senior Project Director at Digital Promise. And why am I here today? I thought that was really great that Marianne started with a why, because in my other life outside of education, I fancy myself a writer. And so storytelling is really important to me in leaving that space. For me, it's definitely all about education, uh, and not just uh, in the rural you know, education that I had where I saw all of the challenges that my teachers were facing and challenges that we as students were facing about uh, what access we had, like internet access or any of that. But when I was teaching in Miami, it was very much isolated. I taught reading and they put all of the kids that were below reading level in um, a dark hallway uh, where no one would see us and they tried not to like, they tried to pretend we didn't exist. And so as teachers, a lot of the teachers were just really disheartened by the job and not having support. And so what was wonderful is working together with other teachers to say like, no, we're gonna look at some research backed uh, based practices around reading, using Fontes and Pinnell, making sure the, the uh, students knew like what grade level they're reading on, get them excited about moving ahead in their grade level. And we started seeing some really powerful movement in our students when they saw the same thing in multiple classrooms. And the teachers that were skeptics started wanting to do it as well. And then there was this whole thing about what's happening in the dark hallway, like kids are learning, we have to pretend they exist. But we still weren't really getting a lot of opportunity. We weren't being recognized for that work we were doing through uh, lesson studies and collaborative um, instructional planning. And the same people were getting the same opportunities all the time. And myself and five other educators started a professional development group for black educators in Miami who uh, were not being looked at for teacher leadership roles or coaching positions and came together to think about how do we help each other advance in our careers? How do we support um, our teachers? And so through all of that work, I just have a love for professional development and learning and working with colleagues to just increase learning, engagement, uh, and chances for students. So all about equity of access and equity of opportunity, which are both of the two ways that you'll hear me describe micro-credentials. So micro-credentials help you have equity of access. If you're someone in an area where there isn't professional learning in a particular space, how do the micro-credentials, especially you know, when they're living on a public platform, help you to be able to engage with that skill? And the resources within a micro-credential, they're not meant to be exhausted but they are a place that someone could start if they don't have any other access. And equity of opportunity. How do we make it so that we're not saying that like this person gets this role because I like them, I know them, and the same people are getting opportunity all the time? How are we really honoring the fact that like when someone demonstrates a skill that we're recognizing that and giving them opportunity to do more? So I want to tell you a little bit about Digital Promise. I've been at Digital Promise for three and a half years, and I just want to like frame the work that Digital Promise does and the work we specifically do with micro-credentials uh, before jumping into talking a little bit more about some of these case studies. So Digital Promise, we believe in the power of networks. So we believe that there are challenges facing education, and when we bring together people who are all working on those challenges, that can be very powerful. We believe in the power of story. Story helps inspire people. Uh, I always share my story because like people connect. Like I looked around when I was telling my story and I saw that people were nodding along because they're like, yeah, I recognize that too. We believe in the power of research. Um, so Digital Promise is a national nonprofit. Uh, the two big arms that we do is we do a lot of great research and we do a lot of great work around learner experience design. And that makes us really unique in the space uh, in terms of like the research that lives uh, within house and um, that we're a nonprofit. 
And then also we believe in the power of engagement. So people can solve their own problems. I was just talking uh, to someone earlier about one of my favorite things about KVEC is when I came here uh, to Hazard two years ago, I was so inspired by everyone saying like, no one's gonna show up and like change all of our work for us. So we have to dig deep and do it ourselves and we have the talent to do it. And at Digital Promise, we're just helping people like tap into that. We're not solving anything for them. And so when I talk about micro credentials, I just wanna make sure that there's going to be like different definitions and that's fine. Like there doesn't need to always uh, be one thing all the time, but this is what I mean when I talk about the micro credential work we're doing. So micro credentials recognize a discrete competency, so nothing really big, but a really bite-sized skill supported by research. They are on demand, so don't need to wait till March for professional development, you could do it when you want personalized and shareable. Shareable is really important. Um, the micro credentials that we're doing are part of the open badge community and being able to um, share those micro credentials and have access to them whenever you need to. And to earn a micro credential, an educator must demonstrate competence to the submission of evidence, which is assessed against a rubric. And I always uh, bring in that part about evidence because I still have people who have conversations who are like, so if they like say that they can do that or they finish the course and they get the micro credential automatically, like we're never gonna do any kind of automatic uh, granting of a micro credential because there still needs to be that demonstration through the evidence and assessed against the rubric. And then real quickly, our micro credential components are, there's the competency, which is the what, the key method, which is the research backed how, we have method components, research, resources, and then the meat of it, which is a submission criteria and scoring rubric. And then uh, micro-credentials for us can be displayed as open badges, meaning they're specific, transparent, uh, stackable. So you hear that a lot, like how do we stack micro-credentials and say like a series of micro-credentials can lead to a certificate or greater coherence. And again, they are portable and shareable. So Digital Promise micro-credentials at a glance, we have over 50 issuing partners, over 425 micro-credentials, um, and then we also partner with the NEA, but they have micro-credentials on their own platform, and then over 5,200 educators on the platform. But now I'm gonna get into what are the challenges facing education today? And so one of the things we've been doing is working with leaders across the country to map out what some of these challenges are. As you can see, some of the ones being pointed out are student learning, family engagement, assessment, um, equity, professional learning and support. So you can look at this map and be like, ooh, that is really overwhelming. There are a lot of problems and challenges in education. And there are a lot of challenges. But the reason why we map these out is we know that to be able to tackle these challenges, we need to have people who are on the front line, our educators, our education leaders, who are um, being provided the opportunity to learn how do they tackle these challenges. So the two questions that leaves us with is, how can we support educators with more opportunity for professional uh, growth? And also, how can we evaluate the impact of professional learning to understand if district and state goals are being met? And I think everyone can really resonate with district might choose a, a district goal. And then uh, suddenly there are all these things coming in. Okay, now we're gonna have mentor teachers. We're gonna bring in this third party to do like after school coaching. And there's so many pieces you put together. But how do you know that all those pieces that you're putting together are actually making the impact that you need it to or are actually getting you to where you wanna go? And these are the two questions we're gonna talk about today. So I'm first gonna talk about embedding micro-credentials into a system of professional learning. And you've heard people say it already today, but I just wanna reiterate that when we talk about micro-credentials, it isn't about like, let's replace everything that exists. There's such rich professional learning happening in like all of your districts, states, organizations. So when I'm talking about micro-credentials, I'm talking about embedding it into a system of professional learning. People love the face-to-face. -face. I love the face-to-face. -face. It's why I still go down, even though it takes me an hour and a half to get to San Mateo from where I live, to have face-to-face -face time with my team, because I can't just always do it virtually. So how are we embedding micro-credentials to enhance a professional learning and, a, it, and treat it as one tool, though a very powerful tool, in your toolbox? So we know there are multiple ways to engage in professional development. You know, there's PLCs, lesson studies, coaching, peer coaching, mentoring, all of those sorts. 
But when we're talking about enhancing professional learning, how do you provide on ramps to engaging in new skills? So if you say suddenly we have uh, professional development for uh, to support teachers with English language learners, you might have teachers coming in at very different levels. Someone who's coming from a district where 70% um, of the students were English language learners, so they've already had a lot of that rich learning. Or someone who's like, I don't even know someone who English is their uh, second language. Like, how do I start connecting with my students and really helping them? So how do we provide those different on-ramps? How are you recognizing educators for their skills? And how are you providing opportunity in areas that you may not have existing supports for? It's okay if you don't have supports for maker learning or computational thinking. The, um, the role of a school already is playing so many different things. And it might be that it doesn't hit your like top three priorities that you know are gonna move your district or your state forward. So then how are we still providing opportunities for educators who in their classroom or their interests still want to go deep in that space, but maybe it isn't a district priority so you don't have the funds to really go deep in it, but you know these people still deserve opportunities as well in those areas. So that's why we get to supporting a system of micro-credentials. So thinking about micro-credentials as coming alongside all of those other opportunities that we talked about. And some of the things that you need to do to support a system of micro-credentials if you want to bring one in to support all um, professional learning happening is you need to build knowledge around competency-based learning with micro-credentials. It's a little bit like learning something to learn something. Uh, you have to be able to switch your mindset from I'm going to sit in this professional development and then that will be the end of it. It really is a mindset shift to thinking about, okay, if I'm gonna work on growth mindset in my classroom, I'm gonna look at the artifacts that I need to collect to earn this micro-credential. How am I planning to uh, think about how I do growth mindset right now? How do I want it to change in my classroom? And then what, how am I gonna document the change in my classroom so that I can upload it? All that is such a change in mindset of how professional learning is done. So you really have to build common language around it, build the tools around using the technology platforms, as well as um, put together uh, multiple pieces so that people know um, that competency-based learning is different from some of the other learning they've been doing. Then you need to set up communities of practice and cultivate collaboration. Uh, collegiality is really important. Agency is really important. In the pilots that we have done with districts and states, the number one factor that had a huge difference in whether a pilot was successful or not was whether or not an educator felt that they had some kind of voice in what was happening uh, with micro-credentials in this new form of professional learning in their district or state. And that doesn't mean that you can't have like priority areas, but think about having a teacher leadership panel where they reflect on the micro-credentials, giving um, them some access to being able to review the micro-credentials that might be chosen. So the agency is really great and the collaboration is important. People love the collegiality that someone's working on something with them, can reflect back and forth, give them some feedback uh, before they submit. And then encourage educators to set goals. Um, the KVEC example I'll talk about later, they're all working on learner engagement and they're able to set goals around what they wanted to do in their classrooms. And then also build out incentives. We know there'll be early adopters. You saw Marianne's bell curve. These are always early adopters who are excited by things, intrinsically motivated. But just like any other profession, um, as we're growing in our profession, uh, there should also be external ex incentives as well. And that can look very different. You'll hear me talk about it in some of the examples. Could be continuing education units, could be teacher leadership pathways, base uh, pay uh, salary increases, but building out incentives and again, going back to communication, being clear about the incentives with your educators is really important as well. So last year we did a study called Micro-Credentials for Me, looking at different use cases of micro-credentials across the country. And we walked away with four ways that we saw micro-credentials impacting systems that they were embedded in. One was professional growth and empowerment. The second was strengthening classroom practice. The third was deepening a culture of reflective and powerful learning. And the fourth was improving student learning and engagement. So I'm gonna walk you through all four of these and give you some examples of what that looked like. 
So for professional learning and growth, in Juab School District, they're part of our League of Innovative Schools, they built out a teacher leader pathway that was entirely competency uh, based. They had some written things that they did with reflections, but 10 micro credentials over the course of the suggested time was two years, led you to a teacher leader pathway that also uh, led to uh, base pay increase. And in a rural district like Juab, it's also a way for them to retain teachers and get them excited about being there. So Juab realized that they needed to do a couple of things. They needed to allocate time, they needed to have pay and leadership incentives for educators who earn micro-credentials. So again, about clear communicating the incentives. And for them, it's about disrupting the system. Everyone was kind of bored with like what was there. They felt like it was just like Utah said the thing they had to do and they had to do it. So for them, by infusing it with the, uh, the educator voice and the educator engagement, really breathed new life into what people saw as like new opportunities for them that weren't there before. And they were able to align it with their district needs. And one way they were able to do that is they use this good, better, best fit. So it's this beautiful Venn diagram where they ask, the, they ask the educator to ask themselves, does it have to do with your job context? Are you interested in it? Does it align with our district goals? And then also, does it also kind of fit that need of the Utah Effective Educator Standards that they're going to be um, evaluated against eventually anyway? So going from good, better, best, the best fit is that star in the middle where it's meets their education context, they're interested in it, it's part of the district goal and part of the Utah Effective Teacher Standards. In Kettle Moraine, many of you have probably heard about them. Uh, they've been doing micro-credentials for several years now. So they have a focus on personalized learning and they've gone really far with their students when it comes to personalized learning. But they're also able to start thinking about what does that look like for our teachers to have personalized learning? And so they started with individual strengths. How do I understand my strengths? And my strengths actually help guide where I need to grow. And what they saw is, um, what they do is they have a set of micro-credentials every year, and they have teachers that look at it, and district leaders, and they have an approved list of micro-credentials that, when earned, go from $200 to $600 in a base pay salary increase that continues with you with each year. And what they saw is that it increased collegiality, and by 2017, 80% of their educators had earned at least one micro-credential in a three-year period. So it isn't like a small subset of, of educators in Kettle Moraine earning micro-credentials. It's like a big part of their school culture. So for strengthening classroom practice, I'm going to show you this video real quickly. It's a 40-second video, I think. I think it's a great process in the sense of you can see it happening in action. Whereas if you go to a regular professional development, you get the professional development, you take it back to your classroom, you may use it, you may not use it, and you may not see the results. Whereas when you go through the micro-credential, you actually see a change in what you're doing. While working through the design thinking micro-credential, uh, I noticed a big change in the feedback I was giving my students. That's one area that I wanted to grow in. And so I was able to provide students with meaningful, relevant feedback, and that showed in the work that they resubmitted. I think it's a great process in the sense that In the third area, deepening a culture of reflective and powerful learning. In Clark County Education Association, uh, they started out as an area that they were just, Clark County decided they were going to use micro-credentials. About two years ago, they decided that up to 30 hours and the hours that can go into going across uh, salary lanes could be digital promise micro-credentials, which was great. I was like, okay, it's a great uh, starting place. That's, a, you know, at least people are getting something for earning the micro-credentials. And they've gone from that to now, there is no limit to the amount of hours that someone can use for micro-credentials and the Clark County Education Association has now created micro-credentials that, um, that are based in community needs that they use as well. And it started with they reorganized the school district. And when they reorganized the school district, they actually put the, um, 
the power in the hands of the school-based teams to make the school-based decisions. Shocking, I know. School-based teams making school-based decisions. And this helped them broaden the conversation of leadership. So they were seeing that when schools were failing and they were talking about like leadership, instead of talking about the failing leadership as just leadership at the top, they realized that they just brought in the idea of who is a leader and who could be cultivated as leaders um, and disseminate some of that leadership power across the schools that they were able to help turn around those schools faster and really help uh, get people excited about staying in the district and cultivating a home there. And one of the ways they're able to do this is that they didn't just stop with continuing education units. They've uh, enabled micro-credentials to be used for license renewal, salary advancement, evaluating uh, evaluation evidence when the educators are being evaluated, and school-based leadership. So what's happening is they're able to identify people who are really great at particular areas through the earning of the micro-credentials. And these are the three areas they're working on. Engaging stakeholders, using data, and leading with a shared purpose. Because these were the three identified areas for the school-based teams that are really changing the culture that uh, they're seeing. And now they actually have a set of schools, I think there's eight of them at risk of state takeover, that they're working with them to use this model to work on um, shared leadership structures in the school systems to uh, get them to be able to keep their own autonomy and not be taken over by the state. And then the last area, improving student learning and engagement. So question I get a lot is, how are micro-credentials like shifting students? Are they doing better on tests? Are they, you know, are they able to get better grades? And we're too early to see any kind of things on like, oh, is this teacher with this micro-credential? Are their students doing better in a test? But what we can see is how their students are learning and engaging differently. Because so many of the micro-credentials are about shifting classroom practice. And all the research shows that when um, students are the ones who are really owning the work in the classroom, that's when they're really engaged and that's when they do the best learning. So again, the example here is from the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative. And teachers were identifying barriers uh, to their professional learning and what was happening in their classrooms. And they wanted to shift the school culture to be more collaborative. So what they did is they all started earning the learner engagement micro-credential, but in uh, professional learning communities or as groups. And what they were then able to see, it wasn't just a shift in one person's classroom. It was then leading to whole school shifts, which is more powerful for students to go to one classroom and another classroom. And they're seeing that all of their teachers are changing the way that they engage and they feel like they are having more agency in their learning. And some of the other things that people are saying is that like micro-credentials makes them feel very proud as a teacher, seeing that they're listening to the feedback and doing the revisioning work and taking pride in their schoolwork, talking about um, their students. And others um, talking about how redesigning their classroom helped them engage with their students differently. Uh, so I definitely want to pause there and see if there's any questions about the first half before I go into evaluating the impact of professional learning through micro-credentials. Yes, and if you have questions, if you could raise your hand, I'll bring out the microphone for you. No question is a dumb question. <laughs> My, my question's a practical one. Uh, how is all this funded? Uh, the work that Digital Prom has done is uh, it is uh, grant funded. So we're a nonprofit, and so we uh, have grants that we get from large bodies to do different work. Uh, some of it's smaller if it's like a very specific area of a micro-credential that someone would like to see uh, built out, and other is uh, bigger to help us more system-wide. So example is we have had money for the last several years from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and that's helped build out a lot of the systems that we have and the micro-credentials that we have in uh, really high needs areas. Practical questions are good too. <laughs> All right, so I will keep going. I will just see it as a sign that everything's really clear. So now I want to talk about evaluating the impact of professional learning through micro credentials. So you've got a district goal. That's really great. You know, maybe your district goal is um, engagement with parents. Maybe it is building out your English language learner programs. 
But now what? You know, you're probably going to identify the challenge. You're going to create structures to enable the change. And you're going to provide opportunities for learning. That's all really great. But how do you know it's working? And what can you point to as a sign of shifting mindsets and actual shifting practices? So in a competency-based system, we can use it to evaluate states and districts working towards a goal because we know that there are desired state and district outcomes. And we know that there are multiple professional learning supports and opportunities happening in the district. So then how can we use micro-credentials to capture evidence of the change practices and be one kind of evaluation tool to say, oh, people are really successful in earning these micro-credentials that are aligned to this district goal. We're now having like evidence we can point to as shifting practices in the district. So I'm going to go through a few examples. The first is some work that we are doing with five districts, five very different districts, Broward, Iowa City, Talladega, which is in Alabama, Compton, and Vancouver. Um, their district goals on compu computational thinking to support next generation science standards. And so all of these districts are, they're doing PLCs, they're doing in-person PD, additional computational thinking work. They're using their LMSs such as Canvas to facilitate conversations and collaboration. They're getting peer feedback, they have leadership cohorts. And this is just a sampling of the work that each of these districts have to support their computational thinking work. And then what we could do is, oh, is that what they're looking at is all of them are earning the same micro-credentials. So everyone in this cohort who's becoming a leader in computational thinking for next generation science standards, they're earning the same set of micro-credentials. And they're looking at the evidence being submitted and the success rates of them earning the micro-credential as a way to know, like, are these things working? And which ones are the right levers? Because if we're asking the right questions and saying, which one of these things did you engage with? And matching that to see like, oh, the people who engage in in-person PD were much more likely to have some really powerful shifting practices in their classroom. That's how you know, like, I, I want to invest more in that area. But maybe the peer uh, feedback or the additional computational thinking work isn't actually the lever that you want to pull. And that might be something that you you don't invest as much in because as we all know money is not unlimited and we need to know like where are we investing that's going to be able to really let us know if we've reached our goals or not another example is and Marianne talked a little about this is in Iredell Statesville North Carolina they wanted to increase understanding of learner variability and best practices to do that uh, work so again, they were doing professional learning communities, in-person PD, workshops on technology tools that they could use. There's something called the Learner Variability Navigator that they've been using to help them in their classroom. And they do uh, check-ins, and they, again, have teacher leads. And what we've been able to see is, because we actually have a paper out with Friday Institute about this, is that the artifacts are a very powerful way that they're evaluating the effectiveness. Because out of all the artifacts they looked at, the teachers were using the strengths-based approach that they were hoping that they would use because it's not enough if you understand learner variability in your classroom. It's also about like, are the kids feeling welcomed in your classroom? And by using a strengths-based approach, you're letting the kids know like, oh, you're really great in this area. Let's lean on this to support you with this other area. And again, you saw this in Marianne's presentation, but these were the common themes that came out of the micro-credential submissions. Teachers, researcher, and like, I love that. Like, we are action researchers in our classroom every day, and it's great to be able to be recognized as that. Using empathy, the strengths-based approach, leveraging peers, student-teacher metacognition, and student ownership. Like, students getting, like, really excited uh, about owning their work and, and improving in the classroom. And the last area I want to talk about is improving classroom techniques in STEM. So we work with the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee in their Milwaukee Master Teacher Partnership. And what that is, it is a five-year NSF-funded uh, grant with the Milwaukee Public Schools. And in five years, the educators in the program are going to earn 20 micro-credentials. And they're then supposed to be leaders going out into Milwaukee Public Schools to help their other teachers. And so they're using micro-credentials again, the 20 that they earned, to evaluate the effectiveness of a five-year program. And so the pilots reshaping how educators approach their work, in-person and virtual courses, uh, and they're seeing that educators are shifting from a traditional model to a more flexible student-driven learning where students drive the problem solving. And educators are speaking less and students are engaging more. 
Don't we all want to do that? Uh, and then again, in Juab, they're also using it to evaluate um, as one statistic of a metric of their goal. So what are we learning from all of this? And I saw my time warning. So because micro-credentials are rooted in research, flexible, driven by educators, and document evidence of best practices and change in practice, they allow schools and districts to offer support and professional development on demand, document evidence of professional growth and shifts in classroom practice, and measure the impact of their professional learning efforts. And that all matters because it helps us to address shifts to more student-centered practices, use of research-based instructional practices, educator satisfaction with professional learning opportunities, access to professional learning opportunities, and teacher retention and balancing district priorities with educators' needs and interests. So what can you do when you leave here? One of the things that you can do is you can contact me to learn more or get started. I love having these conversations with people. Just my first name at digitalpromise.org. Uh, you can read our new paper with CTQ. I know Barnett might mention it um, some more tomorrow, but I can pass around copies to anyone who's interested. It's around micro-credentials and education policy, like what are the important questions we need to be asking. Uh, you can explore options with your teams to recognize and incentivize micro-credentials. And then my favorite way is the best way to know about micro-credentials is to earn a micro-credential. And there are over 400 to choose from. So if you're wondering, how long will this take? Is the system smooth? Like, how, like, crazy is this for my educators to start doing or my education leaders to start um, really feeling like they can invest in it? Earn a micro-credential. There's probably one on there that you can earn or you can you know, get a teacher that you really trust, or teachers, which is better, that you trust to go on there and check it out. And then I also want to leave uh, you with a challenge. Uh, this is from a micro-credential convening we had a few years ago. And the area that really sticks with me is this idea of like a poverty of imagination. And we just celebrated Father's Day um, last Sunday. And my whole family, that, uh, we're immigrants from the West Indies. And I wouldn't be here today if my father just like thought that his like, life on a farm in Guyana and South America was the only life that he could live. So we have to start thinking bigger. And so I want you to take like 30 seconds and with the sticky note on your table, I want you to write one like big thing you would want to do with micro credentials in your setting. And don't like think about what already exists, but if like all those barriers were gone, what's one really big thing you'd want to do with micro credentials? And if the idea scares you, you know you chose the right one. And then while people are writing down, if anyone has any questions, happy to answer. Yes, I do. My name is Denny May. Uh, I'm a due process consultant with Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative. And I was just wondering if the research is in that supports uh, this type of uh, certification, credentialing, and if it is, in, in fact, impacting student learning and how is that being captured? Yeah, we definitely have a lot of qualitative uh, research showing that uh, students are being more engaged with their learning with micro-credentials because, again, so many of them are about student-centered practices and deeper learning. And so through the research, we know that that is going to lead um, to students really being able to do things differently. So if you're earning the reflective practice micro-credential, a lot of the micro-credentials are like, where did your classroom start? And where did it go over the course of you earning this micro-credential? So if the micro-credential is about um, kind critiquing, uh, the micro-credential asks to see evidence of where the students were at the start, like a same set of students, and then where they were um, over the course of you doing particular interventions to help them do that kind critiquing better. So we definitely have that evidence. Uh, the evidence that people are looking for um, in terms of like test scores and maybe like long-term learning practices, that's going to be more uh, just longitudinal studies uh, that we are putting the, you know, the stakes in the ground to do now because that's what you have to do. So it'll be interesting, like tiny research is coming out um, all the time, but it'll be great to see like the larger research, especially around if an educator earned a particular micro-credential in let's say 2014, like if I went into their classroom in 2018, is that still an integral part of their practice? Thank you. That, um, that led to a question that's been in my mind around 
Um, is there a duration for a micro credential? And do you have educators who are now maybe going back and revisiting a micro credential? Or how, how, what is the maintenance, so to speak, of, of the certification uh, thought process like right now? So with our issuers, uh, a lot of them will update their micro-credentials if they're like, I'm not asking the right questions, or if any research has been changed. And so they, they are updating what is required of their micro-credential. And because of the back end of how the open badge works, when you change the submission requirement for a micro-credential, you actually have to change the name of it. So it might go from a V1 to um, a V2. Um, at least the way our system is set up. And then the other thing is you can set micro-credentials to expire. None of our micro-credentials take advantage of that now, mainly because our content partners have not asked for it to. But you can, like the actual technical standard, you can say that a micro-credential expires at a particular time. Uh, and then it would say that it was expired if an educator tried to share it. There's lots to explore there. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, can I get three people to share what they put on their post-it notes? <laughs> um, my goal for this is actually to have personalized PD for each of my teachers. Um, we've looked at our PGPs, and so my goal is that we can match what their need is with a micro-credential and that will give them the individualized time, whether they want to use their um, planning time at school or whether they get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and no one's up with them on a Saturday. But they can work at their own pace for the school year and hopefully be able to use what they're learning in their classroom and meet with me periodically to see how that's going and how I can support and help them and hopefully earn a micro-credential at the end of the school year. So, Two more people. Thank you. We plan to um, enroll in a uh, coaching um, micro-credential, so we want to first experience that. But we also want to invest in our teachers and um, get them enrolled in a micro-credential. And then that way um, we can see how and meet with them periodically and see how that impacts the overall student achievement. One more person. My district plans on using the micro credentialing with the new teacher, um, new teachers that come into the district, whether they be um, fresh out of college or just new to our district. That's really exciting. I love, uh, especially sometimes people worry that a new teacher, it'll be like overwhelming for them. But I actually think it's really powerful to like at the onset of your time in the profession to say like, oh, wow, people are investing in it being personalized. For me, I'm creating these like really rich digital portfolios. I, I think it's the perfect time to onboard people. That's awesome. And then, yeah. Video, you know, some kind of live. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking about uh, some individuals that I know that are working with children who um, may have repeated a grade. And, you know, how do we know that what they've learned they can put into action and that we can kind of show it live? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, maybe something with a student that they could do. I know this sort of kind of sounds like national board certification where they do the videos, but, you know, is there any opportunity in the future for um, micro-credentials to be like a live practice? Am I making sense? Live <laughs> I think I understood some of that. Um, a lot of the micro credentials do involve video. So you would see someone like in the, the middle of their teaching because you want 
some of them you can't like if the micro credentials wait time I don't, I don't know how else you'd provide evidence except having a video of you using wait time with your um students uh and then others um again you have to show like where the student started and where they went to and create a narrative around that increase in their learning so it is about not just like oh and here's this final product because like how do i know that they've actually increased like you said like if someone is struggling and they're um in their learning, like how do we know that these things that you did that are research-based practices have actually led to someone uh, being able to in, like increase what they're able to do in the classroom? Uh, yeah, so videos are a very important part for a lot of people, um, but videos can also be a little tricky and sometimes we need to give options because there are some like school districts that sometimes are, are not very excited about um, teachers videoing children and then those being uploaded to a third party platform. <laughs> Any other burning questions that came up? Hi, would you speak to us a little bit about the process for evaluating what gets submitted as evidence. I'm not sure because I don't know about Digital Promise that much, but does that happen at Digital Promise? Is that part of a district? Is there an outside evaluator? How does that piece happen for the people participating? Yeah, it's a really great question. So when I spoke earlier that we have over 50 content partners, whoever is developing the content of the micro-credential, they are responsible for the assessment of that micro-credential because they're coming in as like they are an expert in this particular area. And then what they're doing is while they are developing the micro-credential content with us, they're also bringing alongside assessors who are then, they are training on the rubric. So as an educator is working through the micro-credentials, the rubric that they will be assessed against is transparent to them. It's always there. They always know what they're being marked against. And those assessors are being trained to look at like what is rooted in the um, the actual rubric. Because the last thing you want as an assessor is like, I wouldn't have done that in my classroom, so this doesn't pass. <laughs> it's not about like what they would have done in the classroom. It's about like what does the rubric outline. And so that's where the content development is so important because there needs to be a really um, strong line but, um, that goes from the research and what research says um, are the best practices for this particular skill. What research then says are the best things you can collect to show that someone is doing demonstrating this competence? And then are you asking for that in the micro-credential? And then is there still that alignment with uh, what the rubric says it's looking for? And so the, the platform facilitates the educator being able to upload that material. And then there is back-end access for the assessor uh, to go in and be able to mark yes um, or no, passing or not passing in each part part of the rubric and then also uh, include comments on you know what they were excited about that they saw or also where the educator fell short and where they can improve because the goal is resubmission if you don't earn the micro credential we don't want someone to not resubmit we want them to know where they can improve and we want them to resubmit and feel like they have the tools to do so and not that someone said not passing and no one gave them any feedback because how do they know um, where to go? And that's why the grain size is really important because if you have a micro credential on a really big area, like inquiry-based math, you know, like it's harder to really give pointed feedback for that um, versus if you have um, something that's around like creating a student-driven showcase for maker learning. Like that I can give more specific feedback for. Yeah, and then we do encourage all of our issuers to continue uh, recalibrating at certain uh, times with their assessors. And also they're able to uh, download uh, information on their assessors so they can know like if someone's like passing very often, not passing very often, so they can continue to keep that line of communication um, open. Great question, thanks for asking it. Oh, Robert, you have a question. I do. You may have mentioned this between me running back and forth, but to piggyback her question, if you're an issuer and all of a sudden you find yourself with many folks using your micro-credential beyond the capability to assess them all, what are some issuers doing to address uh, having so many to assess with fewer people to assess them? And what conversations are, are around that? 
Yeah, we definitely have conversations around that all the time. <laughs> I just had a, a virtual convening with all of our issuers last week, and so that was coming up often. Uh, there are a couple different ways. Like one, um, you know, we always have kind of our ear to the ground of knowing about school systems that are really diving in deep into micro credentials, and being able to get a, get a good sense of which micro credentials they're engaging with, and being able to have those upfront conversations uh, with the issuers. A lot of issuers are training just like a wide range of um, assessors. So maybe they train like 25 assessors, but they know like, okay, but these are like my three main assessors that I'm going to. I tap into the others um, when I have a lot of micro-credential submissions. And then also because just the way the school year works, there are definitely times of year where we're getting more submissions than others. And that's always uh, right before a uh, good old holiday break, so around December, uh, and then our biggest push is definitely uh, end of May, beginning of June, and everyone's like, have I heard back from my micro credential yet? I need to get this in before the end of the school year. So um, knowing when those times of years are, um, getting people ahead of training more people than they might need, and then also just keeping our ear to the ground.